Hello and welcome to C3PO, the carbon crunching clerics. I got it right. It's brilliant. Yay! Carbon Yay! crunching clerics. Welcome to Father Neil Hook. Hello there. And welcome to Reverend Marcus Siblin. Hello. <laughs> it's very wonderful to have you here. Uh, first, the apology apologies to all of our adoring fans who were looking for our last month's um, episode of C3PO. Unfortunately, there was a technical hiccup with C3PO last month, so I apologise for that. My fault entirely. Um, <laughs> uh, Marcus, would you lead us in prayer before we begin? Mm, certainly. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for all the good gifts that you bless us with, and especially thank you for the beauty and the bounty of creation. And we thank you that you entrust to us um, in partnership with you, care of this earth. And we pray that you help us to, to do that duty well, to love, care and cherish for that which you've given, uh, entrusted to us, that uh, not only is it here and flourishes for all people today, but the future generations can enjoy your bounty. We pray this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. 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 Thank you very much. So we are heading very rapidly towards Easter. And um, we last month we would have covered up to Palm Sunday. But unfortunately, due to the technical hiccups, we are going to start this uh, podcast today from Palm Sunday. So I'm going to do the reading uh, for Palm Sunday, which is taken from the Gospel according to Mark chapter 11. When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethage and Bethany near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, go into the village ahead of you and immediately as you enter it you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you why are you doing this, just say this. The Lord needs it and will send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? They said that they told them what Jesus had said and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest. Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, it was already late. He went out to Bethany with the twelve. Here is the lesson. Thanks be to God. So, where are we with um, with Palm Sunday? Um, I, I seem to remember you saying something really profound about Palm Sunday in our last podcast that didn't make it. Uh, I think that was you, Neil, who said something about the whole of creation. So perhaps we can start there. Can you remember yeah, that? Um, so the, the triumphal entry, uh, Christ's acclamation um, as he goes into Jerusalem, um, is the fusion of, of three things. Christ is sat on, the, uh, on a humble ass, um, so he, he uh, he's been born uh, by the animals, um, but the uh, the people who are acclaiming him um, pluck palm fronds and lay them on the ground as well. Um, so it's as if all of creation, the plants and the animals, are bearing him in, um, and so it's that that fusion um, of of all three parts. Um, and interestingly. Um, and it's something that I reflected on after we recorded last time. Um, they didn't cut the tree down. They didn't cut the palm tree down. They plucked some of the branches. So it was sustainable. And that's something that happens today when we have our palm crosses. Um, they're all produced sustainably. The tree is not cut down um, because 
those charities, those companies that want to produce palm fronds to make the palm crosses for next year, um, know that, that they want the leaves to grow ag again. So there's an element of sustainability there as well. And that I think is something that we can pick out, um, that we can embrace as part of our reflections on Palm Sunday. Um, something that, that we can think about perhaps, even if not on Palm Sunday, in the, the, the couple of days afterwards, the Holy Monday, Tuesday, uh, or Wednesday. Mm. Yeah, I think that's a really good point, Neil, about the sustainability. Because um, you could say on the surface, well, all that, how wasteful you know, to cut down those palms, not to eat them, make paper from them or whatever, just to lay, lay them in celebration before Jesus coming in. But, um, but the story speaks, I think, of there being enough fecundity in creation to supply um, needs for a celebration as well as just kind of eking out existence. You know, I think that's, that's rather joyous, isn't it? That there's a, there is enough. If we manage things well, there's enough for party and fun as well as just surviving. And, uh, you know, and it is a celebratory occasion, isn't it, Palm Sunday? And is, is it, um, one of the gospelists goes on to talk about how, um, so, you know, so, someone says, oh gosh, can you tell the disciples to be quiet, making a lot of noise? And Jesus says, well, no, if I tell them to be quiet, then the rocks themselves would, would cry out. Yeah. And that just the whole sense of all creation singing, rejoicing, the, the revelation, of, you know, or the entry of the Messiah to his sort of, you know, beginnings of his, his kingdom in, in, in Jerusalem. It's, like, it's just lovely, the whole, whole creation celebrating. So I like that celebratory note that actually, you know, because we can get a bit po faced sometimes. We need to be serious about environmental troubles and, uh, threat facing us but the fact that actually if we manage things well is, is enough not just you know for our needs but for our celebration and joy as well I think that's worth communicating to people. Well we know the structure of the liturgy on Palm Sunday um, kind of echoes the structure of Holy Week itself. We have the two gospel readings, we have the Palm Gospel where we, and we're taken to the heights of, of acclamation and joy and then we're plunged down into the depths with the Passion Gospel and we have that similar structure over Holy Week um, itself. So it's important, as you say, Marcus, that we don't, we don't hit that dour note all the way along um, because um, we need to be plunged into the depths from something uh, that is high. And yes, we, we, it's, I think it's appropriate for us to match in terms of our eco-theology, that of Holy Week, we are perhaps living with the consequences of what um, Sally McFaig has called eco-crucifixion. Um, so she teaches, she's a Christian theologian, that what we do to the earth's body, we do to God's body. And at the moment, imminent climate catastrophe um, and climate extinction is, is causing this eco-crucifixion. Um, and what we need to work towards is eco-resurrection and so yeah. there's a there's a way that we can match that across um the the whole of the, the liturgies of holy week um, and in a way it would be better to do that and just in each one of our services just briefly mention and help map on that theme rather than just uh doing one eco service in holy week and pushing it all into that that one slot because if we're serious about our incarnational theology then it does match on to the whole thing no yeah really good thought neil i, I like that the idea of just kind of bringing it in all along the way rather than just having your one climate service a year and it's in i was just thinking before the podcast thinking of good friday and, and you know i hadn't heard of that the author you'd, you'd mentioned but that's exactly what i was had in mind was a sense of on Good Friday, we recognise human sinfulness, taking Christ to the cross and him suffering and, you know, and being crucified for that. And of course, um, you know, uh, it's, we are doing the same thing for, to, to the creation, human sinfulness, causing the creation to suffer and being away crucified, you know. So, I think, yeah, I think those themes, they're, they're not just, it's not fanciful to map them really strongly on, is it? I think to, to, to our understanding of the gospel story. And then through that, of course, somehow the sense that with, at Easter, with the resurrection of Christ, the first fruits of the new creation, gives us a foretaste of what 
racing can be if we play our part as children of God, you know, and sort of um, and care for it as, as Christ does, that somehow it can, it can come back. You know, there's a hopefulness there that although we take things to the brink, um, God will resurrect, you know, if, 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 if we work with him. So there's a real, real sense of hope there. Thank you, thank you. Um, what about the, I mean, we can't talk in depth about every single day of Holy Week, but maybe let's pick out some of those, some of the slightly, I don't want to say more important days, because I think the whole of Holy Week is more important, mm. but some of, some of the more significant days for us particularly, so maybe Good Friday and Easter Sunday, uh, maybe uh, Maundy Thursday as well. Um, so should well, we start the, with the, tr Thursday? the tritium itself from, um, Monday, Thursday evening through to um, the Eucharist of the Resurrection on Sunday morning uh, is the highlight of the church's year. Um, and yes, we can't dismiss Palm Sunday and uh, Holy Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, but for us, um, that is, that's really important. We gather together on Thursday evening and there are so many different liturgies that, that you can do um, and that churches are exploring at the moment because we're not a necessarily able to be in our buildings, so we can't do that traditional um, stripping of the altars. Uh, we can't do the traditional washing of the feet in service, but we can virtually wash feet, wash 12 feet, um, not by getting people to, to sit with um, uh, buckets in their own homes, but think, what is that? Those are 12 acts of service. Mm. So we can commit to 12 acts of service around creation for that Monday, Thursday evening. Mm. Um, and there's normally a vigil as well after, um, you know, would you watch in the garden at night? And it's important to remember that it, where it took place, it took place in that garden. So Christ took his disciples away from the town into uh, this place where they could be part of creation, far more aware of it. Um, and that's something that, that we need to, to think about when we have that, um, that vigil as well. Yeah, good thought, Neil. I like this. The, the location being really important too. Yeah, I like that. I mean, Monday, Thursday is, is it, it's an important day, I think, for our for eco theology, because um, uh, you know, way back in Genesis, a, a criticism criticism often levelled at the church was that um, the Old Testament teaches it says human humanity has dominion over creation, you know, and and uh, and, and that's just um, put us in this position of mastery and caused all the troubles that we've we've had, you know, and it's a misinterpretation of what dominion means, uh, even in Old Testament terms. But um, but of course, in the light of Christ, that's that's absolutely not how we see. Um, leadership, because Christ showed us, you know, that to, to be, um, you know, to be to be in charge, to have a position of responsibility, is all about service, and 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 no, never so more clearly illustrated than on Monday, Thursday, in the washing of the disciples' feet, showing us in sort of picture, you know, enactment, you know, what what it means, because that's how we understand and learn things, isn't it? Really, you know, through stories and, and vision, and so um, if we have dominion of creation, well, we do have dominion of creation, but. How is it to be exercised? Well, Christ shows us what a true leader does and what does a true leader do? Serves that which is in its charge. So it's a very different sort of dominion. It's about serving creation, um, not lording it over. So that's quite a strong theme, I think. For I think you're right, Marcus. I think people um, misinterpret the word dominion as domination. Mm. And it's not. Um, it's, it's about God entrusting the world to human beings, recognizing the power that we have to um, conserve, to care for creation, to live in harmony with it, not to um, ab abuse. It certainly doesn't give us free reign to, um, to use up the earth's resources. No, that's right. Yeah, I and mean, I think, I mean, the church sometimes uh, well, has been guilty of that, but 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 not particularly. It's just humanity has been guilty, I think, since the scientific revolution, you know, of um, of thinking, gosh, we've got these tools at our disposal. How can we use them to to get the maximum profit out of what's before us? You know, and I think it's much more that there's a fault it lies with that general human tendency to want to dominate, exploit, and get as much as we can for ourselves, rather than 
any innate weakness in Christianity or, or Judaism for, for that matter. Yeah. And then uh, obviously with Monday Thursday, we have the institution of the Holy Eucharist um, and we have the bread broken as the body is broken. Um, and we have bread and wine, which is a common, um, it's, it's a common sacrament. It's a common symbol that unites all Christians. Uh, we may have different views of what's going on, but nonetheless, it is a subject for unity and mapping on that idea of we talked before of um, broken bread, Christ's broken body and creation as well as breaking creation um, is something that, that takes us through to the crucifixion, to the, to the cross, um, to Christ being hung upon a tree as one of the, one of the hymns puts it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm going to have to move us on in a moment. Is there anything else you wanted to add about? I just wanted to highlight uh, Easter Day um, and that passage from John where Mary mistakes Jesus for the gardener. She doesn't mistake him for a soldier. She doesn't mistake him for a priest. She mistakes him for the gardener, somebody who works in harmony with creation. Um, who helps, um, who nurtures, who feeds the earth, who uh, moves things to where um, they are best placed to grow and to flourish. Yeah, it's such a great um, analogy, isn't it, I think, for the Christ Christian life, for the gardening, really. It doesn't shy away from the fact that we, we're in the world and we're part of it and we can't make an omelette without crackers and eggs, you know, we've got to, we're going to change things by being here, but, but don't worry about that. You can, you can yeah. shape and change things, the world to be a, you know, symbols and tokens of trust and love as, as well as um, exploitation. So, you know, that's what we're to do, nurture, grow. Yeah, beautiful. And it's earlier in that gospel, John's gospel, um, that the gardener says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and died, it, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. I was going to ask you both about um, governing body this year and what's happening uh, there with relation in relation to uh, the climate crisis in the diocese and what's happening. I, I guess, Marcus, you are probably the best person to start us off on that. Start us off, yeah. Well, I mean, it's very exciting what's happening in a governing body in April. Um, I think I'm right in saying it's the 14th to the 16th of April and uh, hoping to meet in person. Governing body, as you know, is a sort of parliament of the church in a way where the church gathers to debate issues of practice and, and doctrine and try to come to a mind on, on things and guide the church in the, they, we see the ways of Christ. And so with that in mind, um, and in the light of this climate crisis we're facing, there's a motion going before governing body um, asking if the church would commit to uh, becoming, uh, zero, having zero carbon emissions on a fairly, you know, on, a, on a tight time scale, possibly within a decade, but that the motion it says, can, can we as a church acknowledge as a climate emergency, appoint a group to look at how we can move to zero carbon emissions as quick as practically possible, possibly by 2030, if we wanted to sort of go along with the Church of England, but that, that's not so important as the fact we just acknowledge the emergency and commit to, to make that commitment. So I, I, I'm sure it will, will pass and, and it'll, when it does, it'll change the nature of our thinking on, in all sorts of ways, because we'll have to take account of climate change and carbon emissions in all our decision making, build, you know, buildings and transport, obviously, but also just worship and liturgy and, and across the board. So it'll be a big change for the church in Wales, an exciting one. And uh, it'll just mean that we can speak as well, I think, with them um, when we try to criticise or encourage government or you know, other um, society around, if we've got our own house in order, it, we just speak with a much clearer voice you know would be worth listening to so I think that's a, it's an exciting thing so that should pass in in April. One of the things that I'm very keen on um, is the uh, governing bodies not seen to be in isolation. All too often the decisions and the reflections and the motions that are passed at governing body um, we learn about them in our parishes um, but they're seen as something separate almost as if 
the church in Wales provincially and the diocese is something separate from our local churches. Um, but they're all, we're all part of that big church family. Um, so it's going to be really, really important. The only way that we're going to be able to, the church in Wales is going to be able to commit to do this, take this really important step, is if all of the local ministry areas, deaneries, parishes, whatever your local church structure is, get on board uh, and play a part. Think about becoming an eco-church. Um, think about the implications that each church is, is, has uh, on climate change. Think about changing your energy tariff. Um, think about ways in which your, e even if your building is, church building is listed, your church hall may not be. Um, so that just little steps like that. Um, sometimes it seems as if, well, what difference is it going to be for us using eco light bulbs when they're more expensive than the other ones? Well, if everybody in the church and Wales does that, then actually we can make a significant impact. Um, so it's up to all of us to play a part. The, um, the church in Wales provincially isn't going to do it for us. No, that's right. Yeah, they can put, they can say what they want at the, at the top. You know, it, it, it won't happen unless unless we get behind it and, and decide that's what we want to do as well. Um, that's it. actually there was um there been an appointment. I haven't been announced yet, finalised. I think, but um, they're very close to appointing uh, in the Church of Wales a climate champion. There's going to be somebody who's going to um, work full time uh, to try and devise an action plan uh, to help the church move from where we are now to being a, a church that emits zero carbon and uh, hopefully beyond to being carbon positive. But anyway, that's that's just exciting news. We have, we've got a, a very able person um, lined up to take on, on that role. And I guess that's someone we'll get to know quite well over the coming coming year. And you never know, we might actually be able to get them to take part in this uh, in this series. Well, definitely, yeah. Good person to invite, to introduce to you all our um, our loyal listeners and viewers. Yeah, you're right, actually. I'll make a note of that. I think I should invite them to the next one if they're, if they're appointed by then. <laughs> yeah. Marcus, can you, get, uh, just quickly, it was a thought that perhaps you could give more information to the viewers about uh, the Creation Care Action Group um, and, and what, what the group can do to help individual churches reach those goals. I know that we have planned to send out a letter to LMAs, but uh, it might very well be just worth you saying something now quickly as well yeah oh yeah well yeah thanks Abby. i mean we've got we've had this um say for about a year uh, or so a creation care action group which is sort of growing and evolving and it's just interested people from across the diocese those who have got um a heart for caring for the natural world and want to see the church um re respond to that and make it part of our discipleship and so the clergy and, and lay mixed i mean i must say it's a bit clergy heavy, so if there's anyone listening, lay person, it'd be lovely to have, have you. That's because some of us are heavy clergy. There's <laughs> <laughs> that aspect as well. And, um, I'm, I'm speaking for myself. For those of you who are listening and not watching, I'm entirely speaking for, to myself and not about either of my colleagues at all. So it's a bit thick with clergy, shall I say. And, um, but so, so we welcome some lay involvement, which would be great. Um, so we, we meet um, about six times a year. And um, uh, actually, Neil's about to take on chairing now, which would be really, really helpful, just so we kind of spread the load between us. And the idea is just to try and encourage and resource a bit of creation care across the diocese. And so perhaps we could be a resource there if people are thinking about engaging with Eco Church and want to know know about it, or want perhaps a little help on the way, and they can get in touch, and we can we can um, share experience. And those of us have already embarked upon that. And then uh, you know, we just, and we're just there as a as a critical. No, critical, a helpful voice, hopefully for diocese and, and so on, and there's a bit of expertise. Um, and and I, I guess as we go into this new future of trying to achieve zero carbon emissions, um, we'll be called upon to have a slightly more sort of uh, involved approach, I think, with supporting churches with that with that transition as well. So definitely, um, how should I, well, if you're interested in taking part, get, get in touch with me or Neil or Sophie, you know, and where, but you have a email you've got to hand and, and uh, we'll get back to you. It'd be lovely to have you involved. Thank you Marcus. Right I'm going to move you both on again now to COP26 and um, 
the diocesan virtual pilgrimage and various other things that are pointing towards COP26. So where are we at with that? What a fantastic response we've had. It's been absolutely brilliant. People have been taking this on board. Um, those that can are, are walking um, and those that can't are praying for sort of like, you know, just three minutes a day for those of us who are. Sophie's done a brilliant um, Facebook, mm. um, I don't know what you call it, Sophie. Oh, sits, the frame. Facebook frame that sits Facebook on your, uh, sits on your uh, profile picture. Um, so some of us are um, sort of like walking regularly, other of us are doing it in big chunks. Um, some people are gonna be there early, I think, um, at the rate that they're going. Um, which is brilliant, but it's all being done to, to raise the profile. The bishop is involved, the dean is involved, even Archdeacon Paul has said that. Um, he, yeah, I've heard that. Yeah, he, yeah uh, he's committed in one of his recent bulletins to becoming more active by taking part um, in oh, the in the pilgrimage. And I love the fact that we all look so surprised about that. <laughs> Archdeacon Paul, we love you. <laughs> well, the Paul's words, he said, I built more for comfort and speed, but I'll, I'll <laughs> <laughs> and don't think um, that just because we started um, that, that uh, you can't join in. Um, it's absolutely, we um, have made arrangements uh, for you to be virtually airlifted, um, carbon free um, <laughs> to where we, we already are. Um, so you can join in pro rata. You don't have to catch up. You don't have to do the whole 408 miles. We're, we're two and a half weeks in now. Um, so yeah, please do, um, to, do come along. Um, and if someone wants to join you, Neil, it's, I think it's Pembroke Land Roundabout they can join you at, isn't it, at the moment? Me, yes, that's yeah. where I am at the moment, <laughs> yeah, on the A40. Um, <laughs> so uh, there are different routes available, yeah. and different ways of doing it. Um, you know, you can get uh, groups of people together, um, and you can all do a walk. If you've got, um, 10 people, and they did, uh, a five mile walk, then you've achieved 50 miles in one day. And how fantastic is that? That's that's sort of like three weeks worth. Um, so there, we're looking for you to, to take part in different innovative ways. Yeah, some of my Christians are taking part, which is lovely, but some of them are involved in other community things. So one, one of them who is in a WI has got her WI group to, to do the pilgrimage walk, which is great. Isn't it? Really lovely to hear that. And then, um, and then someone else has passed it on to their local, the sort of, um, the village sort of council and network and some of them are taking part as well so i'm hoping we might try and put a bit more on, on the on the website or facebook page to kind of show um how people can be can be involved or anyway but there's a facebook link there i mean that's the best way to get involved now just register your participation and, and see what other people are up to and uh, our sunday school group are doing as i think i mentioned before maybe that's in the lost uh, broadcast um but um somebody from the church not the church no, somebody from Radio Wales has rung up and is, wants, is making a documentary about eco church and and, uh, and, other, and church and ecology, and they're, they're going to interview some of the kids and talk about COP twenty six pilgrimage. So um, if and when that's done, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll give you a link to that as well, which would be quite fun to listen to. One of the things that we were concerned about, um, and this just goes to show, I mean, you can't directly put it down to us, but um, just after the um, uh, the program for COP twenty six was announced, it was also announced that the UK was going to be uh, revisiting um, its first deep coal mine. Yeah. Um, and because of uh, increased awareness around COP26, um, that decision has been called back in um, mm. by the UK government, who are reconsidering um, the permission that's been given, because um, it doesn't fit in with the, um, uh, with the eco commitments uh, that, that have been made. So every ounce of um, extra awareness or publicity um, that we can get out there creates a culture mm. of change. Yeah. Um, and that's what we're going for. Oh, that's, that's good news. I was just going to say, um, so do, do you want to describe your inaugural walk, Sophie? Because that was quite exciting. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so on, the, on St. David's Day, on the 1st of March, uh, Myself and the Bishop and the Dean were in uh, the Cathedral for uh, the St David's Day morning Eucharist 
and Bishop Joanna and I were sent off with a blessing by Dean Sarah on on the initial part of our walk. So um, Bishop Joanna walked down to St. Non's and back with um, with Adrian. And uh, then I went off, went back home, grabbed my kids, and then me and my kids um, went and walked the whole of the Darius Land pilgrimage route. So um, I walked to St. Non's, which was, it was such a beautiful day. It was glorious sunshine all day. Uh, we went to St. Non's right the way around the coastal path. So Porth Place, St. Justinian's, and then eventually ended up in White Sands at St. Patrick's and walked back into the cathedral. Uh, so it was 22 kilometers or 13.6 miles in total and um <clears throat> so between us i've done i've worked it out very quickly i've done about 88 kilometers already so i'm i'm okay on my on my steps between yeah now, on mileage between now <laughs> and and november um I, I we're hoping to go again soon um but we, um it was just such a glorious day it was really nice and we sat down by uh the chapel saint justinian's chapel and just looked out across to Ramsey Island. And it was just, it was so beautiful to be able to sit there and read some of the, the prayers that were in the Pilgrim's Manual. It was a, it was a beautiful, beautiful day. Very blessed. Mm. Uh, but yes, it was, a, it was a good start to the pilgrimage for us. Great pictures. Yeah, just, yeah, yeah. It took me there really. Such a beautiful spot, isn't it? Yeah, it was lovely. It's very beautiful. So there we are. Thank you. Um, right. Hedgehogs. Oh, <laughs> well, I just thought. That's right. Well, it, it, in the lost, you know, the the lost transmission, you know, lost to humanity. What a tragedy! But I think I did mention hedgehogs back back in that, that, that last recording. But um, I'm not sure it arrived. But now we've, we're proud um, custodians of a hedgehog um, who we're looking after um, through its tricky period of hibernation, and um, it's come from the hospital, which is. Uh, a, a, a brilliant lady near, near um, Hanford West who cares for poorly hedgehogs that people bring to her, nurses them back to health, helps them to hibernate and then releases them back where they came from because they're quite territorial. So we're, we're looking after, we're fostering a hedgehog from Nayland actually, it's called, it's been christened Little Owl, you know, and um, he does a lot of sleeping. And, um, but every few days he wakes up, has a nibble of some pet food and goes back to sleep stomps about, spills his water, makes a mess, does a pee, goes back to sleep again. But um, uh, anyway, we're very pleased that he's, he's, um, he seems to be sleeping three days or so at a time. I mean, ideally, he'd hibernate right through because they can hibernate for almost up to six months, hedgehogs. But they sometimes struggle. If they haven't had enough food in the autumn um, and put on enough weight, they can't always make it right right through the winter. But, um, but poor hedgehogs, and they need a helping hand. It's incredible. You know, Beautiful animals, aren't they? But my word, they're, they're struggling. And since the beginning of this century, since the millennium, the sort of population in Britain has halved. Now there's about two million hedgehogs. And so I guess there were four million at the millennium. But in the 1950s, there were 30 million estimated. So it's, it's a sort of dramatic decline. So there's a real worry for them. And not, in you know, why is that? Well, it's sort of possibly change in agricultural practice has, has got a part to play less room for them to actually to, to live. And then uh, maybe related to this rather catastrophic decline in insect life we, we've seen as well just in, in recent years and sort of food just, just isn't there. That itself a product of sort of climate change amongst other things. So there, so um, it's lovely to be able to have that give little owl a helping hand and I hope he makes it when he's released back into 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 Nayland. And maybe I'll try and get a photo um, of him because uh, you're supposed to Weigh him occasionally, see if he's putting on any weight. I didn't want to wake him up, but um, but maybe when he's stirring, I'll get a picture and put him on the put him on the website. I feel a I feel a connection with. Oh, him. that's good. Yeah, because um, just like me, I'm lactose intolerant, and so are hedgehogs. That's right. Yeah. Um, so you shouldn't feed them bread and milk. That's a a, a misconception. Right. Yeah, good point. Um, you should give them cat food or dog food. Um, if you're going to feed the hedgehog in your garden, don't give them bread and milk. It it it, it will really uh, upset their tummies and dehydrate them. So um, yeah, and don't give me bread and milk either because it upsets my tummy. So although I'll pass on the uh, on the cat and dog food as well. <laughs> you don't want the dog food. I mean, no, I've got really. some nice, no. not not a big fan. Okay, no. okay. Uh, 
um there's a couple of things i thought i might mention so um there is a, a group of pioneer ministers in bristol diocese who have uh, planted a church called hazelnut community farm but what they are trying to do and successfully doing is creating a network of um, churches who are doing similar things community gardens or uh, doing um, you, know, you know sustainable church in some way shape or form um, and they're just they're looking really to resource one another and to network with people and to and to talk and have conversations about how we can be sustainable across the country so I've been talking with them and I've now had a conversation with them and with uh with uh reverend mark clavier over in bracken mm. cathedral and uh there's going to be conversations or hopefully going to have other conversations as well but the network is slowly sort of spreading out across the country which is really brilliant news and it's just um they they've been backed by our Russia as well so <clears throat> if anybody would like to know more about hazelnut community farm mm. then um i can give you more information about them um and of course there is also the garden project that's happening in the cathedral um which we are looking for lots of wonderful volunteers to come and help with if people are interested in doing so but obviously we are still under covid restrictions at the moment so that can't happen just yet but uh keep your ears to the ground as it were uh for um more information about their community garden project in st david's Great. anything else from you neil nothing from me nothing from you um, I feel like we should have a catchphrase and it's nothing from me. <laughs> <laughs> nothing from me. <laughs> Anything else from you, Marcus? Oh, I can't, not, it comes to mind easily. So no, that's fine, I think. Excellent. Neil, would you mind closing in prayer for us, please? Of course, my privilege. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, the stars and the universe adores you. Planets spin on their axes in praise of your most holy name. We thank you for the privilege of being made incarnate on this, your earth, to walk alongside in harmony with our brothers and sisters, the plants and the animals. Help your church to be a prophetic voice, speaking out into our societies, that we may move from eco-crucifixion to eco resurrection this Easter and beyond. Amen. 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 The timing of that phone call was. Hello. That's going to make a turn off the recording. <laughs> Thank you very much to Marcus and to Neil for, uh, for today's episode. Um, and we will see you all again next month. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Oh, okay.